Boom. And we are live with half of the behavior panel and a statement and analysis giant himself. If everybody wouldn't mind, go ahead and introduce yourself. We'll start with Greg. Hi, I'm Greg Hartley. I'm former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America and put together this number one body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com with Scott Rouse. Scott. And I'm, I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, body language tactics with Greg. All right. Peter. Peter. Peter Hyatt, I teach deception detection, uh, mostly law enforcement, but also uh, intelligence, uh, some business, employment analysis, uh, profiling, that sort of thing. Well, awesome. I wanted to put this together. I mean, anybody who's watched my channel for 10 minutes knows that I just love panels and I love putting different people together. And it's super exciting when I can put two disciplines together, especially two disciplines that kind of complement each other. And I would argue that you all kind of use some of each other's discipline anyway, when you're doing it. I, I know that um, Greg's definitely using some statement analysis. He might call it another name, but you know, chaff and redirect and different things like that. And um, time periods in between statements, things like that. I believe um, Peter, you've talked about how you're doing a little bit of reading a body language sometimes when you're looking at somebody you're interrogating from time to time. And Scott, I'm pretty sure is putting these in here too. Yeah, we're but really the excited thing is, to be yeah. oh yeah, we, yeah, we're yeah. we're so excited we can hardly stand it. And the thing is, our when we're we don't we don't, we're not doing what Peter does. There's no there's no way. We, Greg and I were laughing about it today. If, if we started now, I'd be I, I'm not going to live long enough to be get to get up in it as far as Peter is. You know that that's a that's fascinating uh, what he does. So we we both find it fascinating. Have the whole our whole panel does the behavior panel thinks it's fascinating as well so you're 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 famous peter so you get on that one with heather. <laughs> well, i think it goes both ways i think uh peter's been watching your channel too from time to time so everybody yeah, so, so the um the recent video on um, the disappearance of summer wells hmm. it was impressive Oh, thanks. That's a tough one to me because your natural yeah, yeah. tendency is they did it. You know, most people want to jump in. The other thing for me that we have to be careful with is, you know, you put a lot of yourself into this thing. And if you didn't live in that world, we tried to take ourselves back a little bit. I'm not in the same world those people in and try to look at them differently than just jumping to a conclusion and based on things. And I, I'm often interested when you're doing statement analysis, how important it is that diction and all those pieces play in. Because in my experience, People who use English poorly can get themselves in a lot of trouble with an interrogator without realizing it because they're chasing the wrong bubble. One of the points that impressed me so much with that video was that um, you strongly contextualized not only the body language, but the language of the father. Um, I had pegged in with a few statements that, A, I couldn't tell you if he was involved because he was repeating what someone else told him, but his... Um, his language is the language of depression. He's defeated in life. Um, I think that you referenced even the, uh, the time he spent incarcerated and all those things would factor into, factor into his pessimism. And so I, I thought that was, uh, that was very fair in terms of looking at the analysis. Well, I, I think That's sometimes, and, and then Scott, I, I think sometimes it's harder for me to, you know, I come from, rural Georgia. So I understand people who have different speech patterns than maybe some folks who are, you know, raised in a city and that kind of thing. And I mean, long time ago, Georgia, not, not, not Atlanta. I'm talking about very rural communities and, and speech patterns are different. And sometimes even when we're paying attention and people shift tenses or change conjugation, it's not, it has nothing to do with guilt. It has everything to do with, that's just a speech pattern for that little area and how they use the words. Yeah, we use different analysts specifically, and we'll, we'll tag them for assistance with regional language, things that we may be missing that sound um, sometimes even foreign to our own ears. And that's a big help working in a team setting, probably the best that we do. You know, that makes me, reminds me, I should have uh, Jim Fitzgerald get involved because he is a forensic linguist. Mm. And that is a, a fascinating thing too. We've talked about that along the angle of, 
identifying a suspect. He worked in the uh, behavioral analysis unit, at the FBI. Uh, he was involved with the Unabomber. Mm-hmm. And I had pointed out that I know that somebody is from the Southwest when they say freeway. And there are certain uh, words and phrases that will identify you. Um, I, I, Pennsylvania area will say, reach me down. And there's a lot of different tells. Is that kind of what you're talking about, Greg? Yeah. I mean, well? I grew up in the world where people mash buttons. They don't press buttons, for example. Odd word choice, yeah. but it's just how they talk. Got gone, you heard them say. That's a passive way of saying something happened. People just pick up odd word patterns. And it's not just the South. It's not just those. A lot of people in places, and I think, Peter, you're you're addressing it there. If you're kind of outside the norm, if you're not living in the the everyday, language is different depending on where people are. And I've interrogated enough people to know you can hear some really weird word patterns. So it's cool to see it. Uh, One of the things that we specialize in, which is to me the most fascinating of all, is identifying the author of an anonymous letter. Mm. Mm. And... It's difficult work. It, I, I always do it in a team. There's always at least uh, one or two female analysts involved also uh, because we don't know starting off if it's a male, a male or a female. And uh, interesting enough, I had a case where um, a company, a large company, received a letter that they felt was threatening about um, one of their top executives and some of the women in the office. And the board investigated it, and um, they turned it over to the police. The police investigated it, and they were not able to identify. They thought they, they had the secretary um, who may have written it, you know, threatening a walkout and, and that sort of thing. And the accused executive's wife contacted me, and she said, you know, I read your book, and um, I think you can help. And so I, I took it on the job and um, I worked with others because anonymous letter, I don't want to be alone with it. Um, if, you, if you get an idea or, or an impression, it's hard to shake it off, that sort of thing. And um, I had concluded that the executive's wife wrote it, the one that hired me to find out who wrote it. And so I was very concerned, and, and I wanted to uh, send the the results to like her therapist's office or something like that. I don't want her to be alone with that. Confronting someone with the truth can be very difficult. And I was concerned about it. And um, it was one of those thou art the man moments where you hired me, but you wrote this. And I think you're putting me to the test here. So when I sent it, um, I, I still followed her directions and. Um, I asked if I could be with her via phone or or Zoom with her therapist. And uh, she said, no, um, I asked the therapist about that, but she said that you're from Maine and you're not very sophisticated. So you wouldn't understand. (laughs) You know, she was obviously covering up. I didn't tell her I'm from New York. Um, let it be from me, you know, that sort of thing. So the the comical part of that can be where um, we can get stuck in a certain region and miss things. So relying on the help of others is always so important. Well, in in my days of interrogating, I've I've spent a fair amount of my time with Middle Eastern folks, you know, during a war or those kinds of things. And the nuance of language there is so odd. You you have to use an interpreter almost always. I mean, I have done tactical things where you ask questions to find out what's dangerous around you. But when you get to nuanced conversation, forget it, because the, the complexity of that language alone, and they speak with a thousand years of history. You know, there are all kinds of nuanced things that reference back, and they all pick up on it. But you can't. You're taking everything literally. So I, I can imagine you run into that a lot. With We did some training in, um, in Europe, uh, Switzerland, with a, um, a firm of some terrific professionals. And I've been over several times training them. And eventually they got a case of an anonymous letter and it was written in, in French. And so we worked on it. We set up a, a, a bunch of us to work on it. And I don't speak French. And it was that the letter was written in French with some Russian undertones of classical Russian 
Um, yeah. And we were able to work through that, and we call it block analysis, where we actually take a step back. It's, it's too nuanced for us to get to try to grab onto. So we take a step backwards, and um, we were able to identify the author. We gave a description of him so so well that the owner of the company that received the letter knew who exactly who it was. Our goal there is seven, seven out of 10. Um, if I can identify seven traits, you know, this is a male, the age. We went as far as to talk about um, what medications we believed he was on, the, the, the writer, that sort of thing. So it was really deep, but I always rely on others that have expertise in their areas that I don't have. So instead of a block English translation, we were able to get a little bit deeper, but the nuance is, is something I would miss. Hey, for something fun, I've got two experts coming up um, right here that I'd like to have you guys look at. This is by request from everybody, and it's incredibly topical right now and fun in a weird way. But we have uh, Rand Paul and Dr. Fauci, <laughs> who uh, famously, shall we say, do not get along very well. And I'd like to go ahead and play. This is from about a month ago. I have both parts. I have the one from a couple of days back, but then I think it's very relevant to look at the first statements here because the accusations came from these first statements. And just to get a read. Now, if you guys want, you know, just please tell me pause if you want to, you know, stop, hear something, go back, think about it for a second or whatever, because obviously I'm putting you on the spot. And, you know, I, I know it's not going to be a very thorough, deep analysis, but just kind of a, surface level and you all can confirm i've not told you ahead of time that i'd be doing this right no mm -mm. no first time i've looked at this video actually one okay. what i like about it though is we can look at the different ways that you guys are kind of analyzing it you know we've got the body language is one methodology and statement analysis is another both just completely fascinate me and i know that the audience will really really love this so without further ado move on senator paul with all due respect you are entire, entirely and completely incorrect that the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain of function research in the Wuhan Institute. Do they fund of Dr. Barrick? We do not fund, do fund gain, Dr. Barrick's gain of function research. D Dr. Barrett does not doing gain of function research, and if it is, it's according to the guidelines, and it is being conducted in North. Carolina. Not you don't think inserting a bat virus spike protein that he got from the Wuhan Institute into the SARS virus is gain of function. That is you would not be in the minority because at least 200 scientists have signed a statement from the Cambridge Working yeah. Group saying that it is gain of function. Well, it is not. And if you look at the grant and you look at the uh, progress reports, it is not gain of function, despite the fact that people tweet that. So they do you still support it? sending money to the Wuhan Virology Institute? We do not send money now to the to Wuhan uh, Virology Institute. We support sending money. We did, under your tutelage. We were sending it through EcoHealth. It was a sub-agency right. and a sub-grant. Do you support that the money from NIH that was going to the Wuhan Institute? Let me explain to you why that was done. The you guys want to look any more of it? or? No, I think it's yet? plenty. Um, Peter? Well, I'm contaminated. I've analyzed him from the beginning. <laughs> Wouldn't be terrible. Oh, well, so we can, I, we can still discuss it, though, what um, what you guys have found or, or think. I think there's definitely something there. I have my own conclusions, and I know the audience does, too. And information has, has come out since that was that, that back and forth. And we're going to follow up with it. Um, yeah. Um, and I forgot that he even said some of the information right here in the statement, um, Rand Paul did. But uh, we'll start with Greg. We'll yeah, simply, I mean, Rand Paul is telling, telling, telling. You can see the adapting. You can see his blink rate increase. He's hostile. He's attacking. He's going after him. And the funny part to me is to watch Fauci almost, he, matadors as I would refer to it, turn, try to get away from what's going on, deflect, almost rolls his eyes at one point. But when the first attack happens, watch the brow clinch. There's clearly the animosity's coming and he knows it and he's going to try to dodge. He says, we didn't do it. And then he kind of shifts gears there at the end. So I, it's not hard to see him matador and twist out of the way to get away from the, from the issue. Um, that's what I got quickly. 
Scott. All right. Well, yeah, it's it's obviously you you can see it's two people that don't agree. I got to be careful here. So uh, I I think uh, Rand Paul coming is coming on pretty strong, and he's a little bit excited because he's he's sort of braced there, and he's got his adapters going down here. So he know he's been rehearsing this in his mind what he's going to say. He knows what he's going to what he's going to ask and and what his approach is going to be. So he's all excited about that. And when and when as Greg says, he's trying to matador out of his way, Fauci. He still keeps he comes back around and tries to stick him with it again. So and I think he sort of gets squirmed in the corner there and he tries to squirm out. I'm not so sure he he made it out unscathed. I think in I general he I think in general he loves the attention, the camera. I noted that the first time he was up. Um, I think he does do the you know, the diversion. I like the, the matador comparison. I think that's great. He does it he does it verbally as well. Um, and he, he, he split hairs with us in terms of uh, direct money or is the money going through a, a, a different segment. It's the same thing. It's the same purpose. So whether he changes the language a little bit in terms of what gain of function is defined as, the, the end result is still the same. Yeah, I often, when I was teaching interrogation, people call it parsing words. That's parsing facts. That's not words. Yeah. <laughs> There's a difference. Yeah. How about when you start off with um, the never? Isn't that quite often coming up in statement analysis? The I have never, nor would I ever. Or, I, I forgot exactly how he phrased that, but he didn't just say just no. He didn't say no. He kind of was like, um, or simply we did, of, or simply say we didn't fund uh, gain of function in Wuhan. It would it would actually right, like, put a stop on on um, Rand Paul. Because what do you do with that? What do you do with someone who confidently makes a, a reliable denial like that? Instead, he used the word never there, which is a, um, a famous example, I think, is that Lance Armstrong never used performance-enhancing drugs. <laughs> it speaks to a, um, an indefinite period of time, a broad period of time. And if you know a particular time period, the never isn't reliable. If there's something that you never have done and the accusation would span years, then never can be appropriate. We're still going to look at it as not being reliable, but we won't call it unreliable. With uh, Anthony Fauci, it's unreliable. <laughs> okay, and the, the never point, is it very common, and you guys can all tell me, to say, I would never do that. Yeah, Which when I hear that. true because I already did it, but I would never do it now. I, I, I already took, you know. Well, you know what? I didn't do that. You're, you're looking for it. Right. I know it wasn't me. I didn't do it. No, I didn't. Well, no. And more than one, no. And one, more than one um, g going against it. And that's not what you're. So that's yeah. what that's what you're looking for. Not I would never do something like that. Really? Yeah. So yeah. that's the first and, and place I go. There are your speech patterns again. You got a guy from, you know, north in the northeast who uses that as a pattern. Never, never, never did that. The other thing is I look for people who do emphatic things of any kind. If it's not part of their everyday speech pattern, if that's the way they talk about everything, I'm okay. But the minute I hear something very, you know, something emphatic, never, absolutely, those kinds of things, that for me mm. is a tether. I want to I want to grab that string and pull and figure out why they use that word differently. I did not have sexual relations right. with that. Woman. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact he even declared which that woman, Miss Lewinsky. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think, um, uh, was it Rafael Pomero, the baseball player? He did the finger pointing at uh, during the uh, PED testimony. Yeah, that's I'm strong. All emphasis. those emphatics are just, it, it, and, you know, for me, when Clinton, he took, you know, a lot of moral high ground. Now I got work to do for the people. Those things always ding, ding, ding. And my interrogator ear go, hold on a second. Why'd you, you bring have to that up? Too, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I call it yeah. high ground or bonding to higher purpose and that kind of thing. Yeah. You're not attacking me. You're attacking over 50,000 law enforcement. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, mm -hmm. I like to be psychologically as crowded as I possibly can. Yeah, it's blame sharing is a wonderful thing. I hear it all the time in corporate America. I always say when a person makes a mistake, it's we. When things go well, it's I. Yeah. Sure. Crowdsourcing right. guilt. Go ahead, sorry. Let's go ahead and uh, continue because their relationship is growing over time. <laughs> in research in Wuhan. My 
microphone. Your microphone. Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. This paper that you are referring to was judged by qualified staff up and down the chain as not being gain of function. So what was, let you me take, finish. You take an animal virus and you increase its yeah, transmissibility yeah. to humans, right. you're saying that's not gain of function? Yeah, that is correct. And, and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly. And I want to say that officially. You do not know what you are talking about. Let's okay, you get NIH. one person. Let's read from the NIH NIH definition of gain of question? function. This is your definition that you guys wrote. It says that scientific research that increases the transmissibility, about, transmissibility among mammals is gain of function. Mammals. Animal viruses that only occur in animals and they increase their transmissibility to humans. How you can say that is not gain of function. It is not. It's a dance and you're dancing around this because you're trying to obscure responsibility for 4 million people dying around the world okay. from a pandemic. And let's let Dr. Fauci. I have to, well, now you're getting into something. If the point that you are making is that the, the, the grant that was funded as a sub-award from EcoHealth to Wuhan created SARS-CoV-2. That's where you are getting. Let me finish. We don't know. Well, we don't wait know a minute. It didn't I come can, from the lab, but all you, the evidence is pointing that it came from the lab, you, and there will be responsibility for those who funded the right. lab, including your... Now, I could be wrong, and I'm, I'm a pause there. I feel like there's stuff in here, you know, at least from my weak interpretation, where... You know, he is not answering what Rand Paul is asking half of the time. He's directing it down another path. What you're saying th is this, and even Rand Paul says, no, I didn't say that. Nobody's done that. And so he's circling around in my mind. Now, am I incorrect on this? Anyone? So two things I saw right off is the first one, we just were talking about crowdsourcing guilt. People up and down the chain have validated this. You're not attacking me. We were just talking about this before he came on. And then you can see that he also does a little bit of what I always refer to as chaff and redirect. If I puke up enough stuff and you follow the right trail, then I don't have to deal with that problem. And I think we see some of that in him. And I think if it were me up there talking about viruses and that kind of thing, it doesn't have the same weight as Rand Paul has because he has a medical background. So that he has to call him out. And I think he's attacking Rand Paul's resume and saying, you don't have the right knowledge to, to attack us. And he's taken the, the royal us at that point, the royal we at that point. He's just trying to stand his ground. But you can see he's starting to get under his skin because when, when Fauci first started, there's almost a little smile in his face. And Peter, I agree with you. He does love the camera. But then once it starts to get hot, you can see his hands starting to show some signs of fight or flight. So he's getting under his skin. That's what I see. Now he's trying. At, th at this point, Fauci starts using what are called regulators. Where you're like, hold, those are the things you use when he's hold on. They speed up and slow down uh, a conversation. What are you saying? Or hang on just a minute. I'm gonna, I got to just stop saying those kind, of, those kind of things. So as he comes on with his regulators, he's trying to get him to stop talking so he can get his point forward. We're seeing at this point an attack on his ego on the man he's become, on, on Dr. Fauci, the, the, the big the, um, the disease guy when it comes to the pandemic, the guy that you know is in charge of it and is supposed to save everybody. So I think we're seeing, the, the, as the attack on his ego happens, that's when we see things start breaking down for him and him sort of lo losing a little bit of control there because he's not using the same calm uh, affect he had, he had earlier. He's starting to get, you can see him shaking a little bit. He's just getting angry and trying to hold it in. And I think this guy's wearing makeup. It looks to me like he's ready for TV. And that's that's another thing that lets me know that you're dealing with somebody who's who's been thinking about this in a in a grandiose way. Not maybe not grandiose, but I'm getting ready for this. I'm a I'm a star, baby. That's that may be the way he's because he's been on they've been, you know, Brad Pitt played him on Saturday Night Live and and people have been talking really good about him. Now here's somebody talking against him to his face in front of everybody that's why he does that checking around as he's saying these things he starts looking around and checking the room and making sure he's sort of connecting with the other people saying you with me you with me what's going on here or do you see what's going on here so that that's the part where where i would start thinking he's a little he's a little bit worried about what's being said because when those illustrators come up and you can see him shaking a little bit that's that's a little heads up for me that his ego's being hit on a little bit there Saint fauci I think he's a, um, someone who's been deceptive since kindergarten. 
and I think he's good at it. I think he knows how to be charming. Um, and I think that what we're what we saw there was he was beginning to lose that facade, and that that maybe hit the panic button for him. Now I want to ask you guys because I, I am curious. I wanted to talk about interrogation as well, and I'm curious what you think. Somebody brought up in the comments um, about how he didn't answer the question. It's Paul's fault for grandstanding and giving him opportunity. Is that the case? And I'm I, I want to ask you because Rand Paul has five minutes, and this is something I do not like about all this. Is I feel like. If we could keep going, I want this to go for a half hour. I want to, you know, I really would like to see this go and go and go and play out a little bit. But what do you all think of how Paul's going at it? I mean, normally you don't just go attacking people. I know that, you know, thumping the tables on TV is a bad thing, but is is his technique useful here? I, I think it is. I think it is. You're talking, you're looking at two doctors going head to head about something they both understand. And, and one of them may have a, a, a little bit more in-depth understanding of the details, but it doesn't take long for somebody else in that business. In other words, to go, Oh, okay. I see what this is. I understand what you're talking about. I see the way this is laid out. I have a background in this to be able to stand up and, and go, okay, let's get going and start punching with them. So I, I, I that, that's, that's, that's what I think. Peter. No, I, I think that as he tries to move away, um, it's difficult because of that time pressure. I would prefer, um, and it wouldn't make for very good television, but I, I obtained a lot of confessions this way, is unless the person is really trying to filibuster me, I'll let them run, and I will note and write down the words that they're using. Because as they're concentrating on not telling me what they, they need to hide from me, those words are slipping in. And so I, I will sometimes not in, even interrupt and let them run as far as they, they can run and then bring it back. Yeah, you find guilty knowledge for sure that way. I mean, people drag mm -hmm. it. They don't know what you know. And in this case, I think because parliamentary procedure and all that, when we're interrogating, we kind of have a little more control than Rand Paul has in this situation. And it, it's a little different. I, I would equate it to like a counterintelligence guy working the street or, you know, FBI guys who work the street where the person can walk. It's not, it's a lot less like an interrogation than it is like that, I think. And I think you're dead on. If you got X amount of time and he knows it and he can just filibuster and block you. Okay. But if you can pressure him, the other thing is I think that Rand Paul is the spearhead of a movement. You know, he's the spearhead of, of trying to get to this and probably the best qualified guy to ask the right questions because if it were me, he'd just say, what the hell do you know about medicine? You know, it's a different approach. So I think if you got five minutes in your hand, you have to take a certain approach. Whereas if I've got an hour and I have absolute control, I have something else. But I agree with you, Peter. Letting people talk is a beautiful thing. I don't ever want them to shut up. And I want to bring that up because I do think that it's a very relevant, specific circumstance. It's not normal in your environment. And I personally kind of feel like Rand Paul was attacking his ego and oh, for sure for deliberately sure. tweaking him and getting him to slip up when it with anger and maybe I'm wrong but I, I do feel like I feel like Fauci um, did slip up I I think that he has made statements that can potentially hang him later I wondered for the last 18 months really the first time I saw him was there no one in the Trump administration that recognized who he was that could not have him parade in front of the cameras? Was there no one with discernment? Man, that one? My yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would say probably no, because um, sadly, I, I have other guests on, like uh, Robert Barnes, who has worked with Trump. And what he will say, and a lot of people who know Trump is, smart guy himself, terrible hirer terrible mm -hmm. recruiter he hires threshold all thinker threshold thinker. That. <laughs> yeah. well threshold thinkers <laughs> like, I, sorry. good that's it i've often thought that i would love to work for him for about a year i think that's all i would last i would hate him forever but i'd be ever forever grateful of what i learned there's some people that run business that way that, that just you, you can glean a lot from them but they're very difficult to get along with. 
In my exposure to people in corporate America, I will tell you that often they're threshold thinkers, meaning once you're past their gate, you might be the least competent person on earth, but you were competent when they first met you or they determined you were and they never revisited it. And they hire poorly mm. as a result of that. Yeah. The employment analysis that we do is, is, is a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. And people will tell you, as, as we ask them in writing to tell us about themselves, they'll tell you basically what you can't ask in an HR interview. You want to say, are you going to go blow cocaine at 11 o'clock in the morning <laughs> in the bathroom? And people will give that away as they're writing. And it, it comes out. So when we're able to get them to open up that way, as a matter of fact, with the um, reference calls, in America, it's, it's the most common response is, I can only verify that he worked for our company from this date to that date. Mm. And I almost always get my information that I'm seeking. Because what I do is I appeal to human nature. I say, no, I understand that. Thank you. Hey, what do you do there? And that sets them going. And we all like to talk about what we do. Even if it's something terribly boring, it's what we do. And once they're talking that long, they feel a certain measure of ingratiation where we're now a little bit tighter and I don't want to let this nice guy down. So um, they may start talking about, for instance, one of the things is, is the weather and how bad the weather has been and how terrible the weather has been. And after a while, you get the idea, I'm not going to hire this guy. He's telling me something that I need to know. And they get the information across. You know, I, I found that if you ask someone a simple question, how do you define yourself in an interview? It's, it's telling because they'll usually give you four words is about what I've found. And those four words tell you a lot about the person because most of us are not going to give you nine words. We're going to give you four or five things about us that we are that define us. And then they'll talk about it and it'll tell you a lot about them. And, and they open new avenues that you are allowed to ask that you can't ask. Do you use drugs? I mean, those kinds of things you certainly are not going to ask or your age. That, who cares about that? But when a person starts talking, they tell you and where they put that emphasis on those words is telling as well when I'm talking to them. Well, now, folks in the chat, um, start, you know, bringing some questions in so we can choose from those. And we've got a, another video snippet that I definitely wanted to go over because the behavior panel, I believe, did cover this exact video segment or, or something really near to it. And so while some questions are out there, obviously, cover I won't be able to answer every question. A busy chat. But... Um, I'd like to get some of them there and I want to play this bit. It's uh, Summer Wells' mother. And this is a good one because Peter's already, you know, written out a lot of the statement analysis on it. And I, I believe you guys have looked at this too. It's the interview where she was beside her husband and talking. We watched some of that one. I think there's a longer version and a shorter version. Yep. Oh yeah. This is a cut out of the longer version, but it's one minute. So, okay. you know, plenty to play with in a you know a short show like we have today me and my mother and her were planting flowers and we went in after we got done washing our hands and she got a piece of candy from grandma and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers and I said okay and I walked her all the way over to the porch and I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV and I told the boys, I said, watch Summer, I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back. And I asked the boys where their sister was. And they said, she went downstairs, Mom, to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times. And I didn't get no answer, which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight she was just gone all right so that is the um the segment and it, that is one you guys were look did cover yeah right? yeah we looked at it yep yeah. okay well awesome so i'm going to start with peter and then we'll go back the other way peter and then scott and greg you know the the setting of it um, speaks to behavioral analysis, where um, this has been a, a quite a lapse of time between the, when she went missing and when the time now that she's speaking publicly, and that's one of the first things in context that I have to look at. Um, I liken it to um, we had a baby that went missing here in Maine years ago, baby Ayla, 
where the father insisted the baby was kidnapped. And when the police set up the opportunity for him to address the kidnapper, he sent out a note saying that he wasn't emotionally capable at this time of doing such. And he later on went on to fail his polygraph. And um, one of the things he said in his own defense was, um, contrary to rumors floating around out there, I have been cooperating with the local police. And that's when I think we, we knew that baby was in water by the words he used. Well, this mom hasn't spoken <clears throat> and she hasn't spoken out. And this is a maternal instinct that I think has been quite dampened. I liken it to if I went with my five-year-old to uh, grocery shopping and I was pushing a card and holding her hand and she wandered off, the first thing I would do is call out for her. I'd get a natural response. I would look and call out for her. And with what? Um, this mother has done and, and many other cases like this, it would be similar to me saying, I know that she's wandered off, but I just want to finish shopping. And I think maybe I'll just finish checking out and I'm going to load the car, drive home, unpack the groceries, maybe take a nap, maybe have something to eat, and then I'll start looking for her. And that type of delay goes against the parental instincts. And I know that the, when we see her, we can, uh, I think, um, you all can tell me better in terms of the mom's affect. and um, But I can look at the words she used even under that setting after weeks have passed that she only used Summer's name when she was quoting herself. So some distancing language. But the, the most important thing that I heard there was I'm a good mother. I'm a conscientious mother. I watched her going all the way up to the door which is, it would be something of a, a hormonally consequential event. Something would have to make me do such a thing. This is routine. She wants to go in the house. So mom slows down the pace of the statement, which generally indicates that she's withholding information coming up on what happened. So as the good mother, we call it the good mother syndrome. And, and it's a little bit disingenuous now because more information has come out. But uh, when it first, when she first spoke, when a mother portrays themselves as a good mother under this type of context, they generally always have child protective services history. Something has gone wrong. They've been accused somehow of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of a child. Well, here she doubles up on it. Um, not only was she watching right to that door, but my mom is good too. She gave her candy. And then I'm really good because I told her brothers, you watch her. But she's five years old. They're in a rural home. Why does she need that careful watching? That would sound like an extraordinary event rather than a boring natural day. So that she speaks to neglect in her language is more than just looking at the, the socioeconomic standing, the, the substance abuse issues, the mental health issues that become obvious. All that wraps around that she had a need to persuade that she was a good mother. And that generally indicates the contrary. Got it. Right. The part that bothered me the most about this was obviously her, her the um, her eye blink, her eye blink, her shutter speed on her eyes. In other words, very, not many times at all did her eyes completely close when she blinked. I don't know if they closed completely the whole the whole talk there and the, her her speech their swollen face and it's not just from being overweight there's some things there that they give you some heads up on on what i would suggest is drug use and alcohol use as well that's the bloated puffy look you're seeing there it's just my opinion but that's what it looks like to me so she's trying to talk and get that one part of her mouth going up and her her her, her jaw doesn't you know doesn't open all the way as she's talking these things let me know she wasn't paying attention. I don't think she, I, I, you know, and how would she know? She's, she's like Peter was saying, she's overdoing it. I had my eye on her. I don't think she had her eye on her. I don't think, I think whatever happened to her could have happened right then. I don't think she knew where that kid was. And, and to, to, to going back to, to the way people sound in the, you know, in the South, I, I think she, she's, you know, I think she's messed up on drugs and it's, it's in that, in the, in a case like that, you're, it's it's tough to follow, and I think she understands that. She may not even remember that, and and she may have been in a situation when you're. It looks to me like pill use and alcohol 
use. So she may not even remember what happened that day. Some, and she may have been reminded of those things as well. But I agree with Peter. It, it's she's trying to make herself look great, look like a, like so I was right on it. And I can I can tell you where she was step by step into that house the last time I saw her. So that when you get details like that, that's when you start. Of course, you keep listening and you keep listening right after that. You just as soon as they finish, you just keep looking at them, wait for them to add more. But it, it, I, I, my money would go on. She probably doesn't even remember what what happened. Then she may have a vague memory of it, but possibly most likely. I don't think she even remembers the kid. Maybe remembers going in, but no way she remember all those details. Greg. Yeah. So for me, you don't have to kill your kid to be a marginal mother. You don't have to kill your kid to be, to know that you're a marginal parent and that you live on the outsides of society. And if you've never known people who live kind of, who are druggy and all that kind of thing, you don't realize they know what they're doing is not normal. And I think a certain amount of guilt comes with that as well. So what I was trying as we went through this thing to be cautious about is yes, there's certainly in there. She's trying to sell for sure that yes, I did this. I was perfect. I did that because we know she probably wasn't. We know that there's probably something in there. I don't know that means for me that she's guilty of something happening to the child, whether she caused it, but certainly she probably didn't do everything she's telling us and something happened to this child one way or another. So what I didn't try to jump to conclusion in, in my time with it is to say she's involved, but She's clearly used some kind of substance. It looks like tranquilizers or something to me. I can't accuse because I'm not there and I'm not doing a toxicology on her or any of that kind of thing. But her face looks like somebody who has taken some kind of substance. She's, you know, if you listen to this kid who says he's been around her, then she was, she drinks and she uses drugs and that kind of thing. And we know that she's got a violent, they have had some domestic violence in her house. Anytime all that's going on, I think people are going to show a whole lot of, for lack of a better term, guilty body language just out the gate because now they're going to be talking to us. We're all going to critique them. They're all going to be talking to local law enforcement, a lot of local law enforcement to TBI and to all those people. And that's the last thing those kind of people want their hands on, especially if you've been to jail, you've been in some kind of trouble, you're using substances, you're living outside the law or marginally outside the law. So there's a whole lot that comes up with it. I do think that there's some bugs in there. The things like when she talks about two minutes, well, we know it wasn't two minutes. We clearly know that. People, that's an exaggeration and other emphatic two minutes. Well, you don't know how long it was. The planting flowers, could that have happened? Yeah. I mean, but that's also a thing where a person tries to make themselves look more normal and that kind of thing. So I'll just leave it at that. I, I will tell you, I want better video of her where she's asked directly, did you do X or Y? I'll tell you also, I read something earlier today, and Peter, I'd love for you to read it and, and read through her long article today where she says that she had to use her mother's phone to call 911 because her phone won't get 911 from where she's at. Mm. Now, that's a new data point for me. And yeah. if I saw that and I was talking to somebody, we, we'd have a very different discussion than I'm seeing here. I, I will say, give me benefit of a doubt because I think people who live marginally already are uncomfortable talking to us. It's just the nature of who they are. And they're going to try to aggrandize and make themselves better than they are because they know that they may be living marginally or doing something that we might judge them for. Just my opinion. I think there's also a difficulty in discerning between um, guilt of having a direct involvement and attendant guilt. Um, I learned a very valuable lesson on this, a very difficult lesson many years ago. Uh, a toddler went missing and I had analyzed the father's statement and he was deceptive. He was deceptive about what happened when she went missing. She was found to be killed by a sex offender in the neighborhood. She wandered out by herself and um, I could not figure out how I went wrong on it. And I later learned that, um, and it was quite comforting, that he was deceptive because he was high. He was nodding on uh, heroin at the time. And so that's what he was deceptive about. When she went missing, she let herself out of the house. And so I, I'm always a little bit more cautious now. I think in this case that neglect is part of this case, whether it was um, neglect in an accident and cover-up, neglect of um, drug purchasing where uh, you invite trouble into your home, right. and that, that could lead something along the lines. I think neglect is going to come out to the forefront, but I don't know where whether her guilt is 
of neglecting the child that got away, neglecting by bringing dangerous people in, creating an environment that way, or something much worse. I can't, I can't pinpoint it with the, the statements. I don't understand the journalists not asking direct questions. Um, some of the interviews are so poor. It's very frustrating. Yeah. yeah, you and I would sit over and say, did you do something to your little girl? Very directly. I mean, as hard, I would use elicitation at the very least, but there's no school. There's no school for elicitation for journalists. There's no school for good questioning for journalists. Maybe, maybe some of them stumble into it, but most of them miss the boat all the time. It sh there should be. You guys should teach a class. Seriously. I mean, it, it, it's not just a, um, a police story, but any story. If you're questioning a politician, knowing a little body language, knowing a little statement analysis and how to ask a follow-up question, I think it would be invaluable to any journalist. Like, oh, I offer it to, to journalists. I think it's that important. Um, some of the child protective service workers in this very state to state greatly, some of them have terrific training. Um, I have a video that I use uh, where an officer and a child protective caseworker have separate interviews with the same child. And um, her interview is almost unbearably boring to watch. She got all the information in a legally sound way. They'll tell us if we, if we just ask. And once someone gets used to asking those tough questions, it, it, it comes very easy later in training. I think the hardest part for most people is that first breach, that first time you ask a question that feels so socially awkward to someone that when I taught young interrogators, you could always tell the ones who had too much bravado and they'd go in and just really enjoy that. But then the best ones I ever trained were it was tough for them. And once they got past it, then they were more natural talking to somebody. There's not all the bravado and that kind of thing. And I always I think I said to you, Eric, I had a young woman named Emily, and I won't give you her last name, but she's the best interrogator I ever knew because she was so introverted. She hated doing what we do, and she would <laughs> take little bites of the information just constantly and not let you quit. It was a beautiful thing to watch. What's well, awesome. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say that it makes sense, though, too, oddly enough. If the interrogator is noticeably uncomfortable asking the question, that may make the person they're questioning feel better too. Like we're both uncomfortable here. We're both on the same team. This is really kind of awkward. And I know you're in an awkward position. I feel really awkward. Can we talk through it? I don't know. I mean, you guys can tell me, but I would think that you can maybe draw some empathy and maybe get something. I don't know. I had to interview a very dangerous uh, inmate so bad that the local guards didn't want to stay in the room with me. So I was going to be locked in with them. The first thing I asked them, he said, are you going to attack me? And it disarmed him. And he, instead of uh, what I was looking for was, why? Why should I attack you? That, that would put me on alert. He said, no. And I was able to get all the information I needed. Nice. Oh, wow. I, for some reason, I thought you'd say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you giving me a reason? That would be intimidating. Yeah, I mean, it was a you know a scary time, but I was on alert and we got that out of the way right away. So I knew he didn't have an intention. And when someone says no to me, I, I generally with my fingers count all the words after the word no <laughs> as they're talking. You know, um, this was a straight no, and he didn't he didn't attack me. Thankfully, he attacked me. He attacked me. <laughs> All right, I got some questions in here. Awesome. Uh, Ziggy Shrugged is a regular. Question for each of them. What one thing do you each specifically look for when you first suspect someone of being deceptive? Uh, starting with Greg, Maslow. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, Maslow's, Maslow's everything, I always say. So <laughs> that's the reason he's jumping on that. But no, for me, oddly enough, you see these big ears? Sound matters. I listen to people because... If it sounds too good to be true, if it's rehearsed and it's cadenced and it suddenly changes, if it sounds slippery, by that I mean the facts are nowhere in it, it's just a great story. I'm listening more than I'm paying attention to other stuff. I always say to people, you can read a lot of somebody's body by you know paying attention to what they do, and, and I'm constantly tilting my head listening to people. And it's not necessarily the words they're saying. It's how they're saying them, how they're avoiding. It's looking for how they dodge. Because... It's our first tool for communication. The rest of the stuff, all this body language and all this stuff we're all talking about, takes some effort to learn. 
but we all talk, we all listen and people do their best to hide information. It's just in there. Scott. It depends on, on what the situation is, what they're in trouble for, what the question is about. For example, if it's something pretty heavy and you come on with, uh, you know, why did you, I know you did this. That's why I'm here. I want to find out why are they, you know, I say they know you did this. And the only reason I'm here is to find out why you did it. That, re that first reaction, not just what they say, but it's how they say it. Do they, are they angry when they say it? Like, uh, you know, are they, are they coming button up against me on that, trying to butt heads with me on that? Or are they calm when I do that? When I say that if they're calm and say, I, I can't think of any reason why they would say that those types of things, then automatic that just right out of the gate, that lets me know something's up. So it depends on 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 what the question is going in and what they're in trouble for. And I guess you would start off with what they're what they're in trouble for. So that I guess it's it's mostly for that in that reaction. I'm looking for how aggressive they are or how aggressive they're not. And if they're um, too complacent or if they're just kind of relaxed with it, like they're thinking, I, I can't believe that someone would think I would actually do something like that. I would, I, I'm not that kind of person. I would know. I would, and the no comes later on, but if they come out of the gate going, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. No, I don't know. I don't know what they told you down there. I don't care what they told you down there. I didn't do that. Why wouldn't you've done it? I'm not a thief. I don't do that. I would never. So when they start that, it doesn't mean that they didn't do it. But that's that's the that's where I look for and say, yeah, oh, that's one of the little chips I put over here on that they may not have done it pile. But if they if they're too calm and they don't look worried that they might get in trouble, lose their job, go to prison, whatever, then that that's when I put the little chip over here in the pile that says, hmm, we may be we may have something here. Peter. I have to um, be very cognizant of how prejudice that can make me. I had a case of a shaken baby and um, I was called out to a hospital and I was a little, little bit late, you know, well after midnight. I went to see the baby first and I probably shouldn't have. The, the baby was brain dead and, and had beautiful blue eyes and a tongue hanging out and you know, the, nothing. So that had already infected uh, got me somewhat impacted me but when i got down to the the lower level of the hospital uh the state trooper was screaming at this kid the, the mm -hmm. boyfriend screaming at him and the boyfriend didn't budge not an inch didn't phase him at all so i'm waiting to get up there to, to ask some questions and i looked at the record and i found he was military and he was you know low level military and just out of the military he knows what it's like to be screamed at. This is you know, years ago. Right. And so taking that and putting myself in check where I've, I've got to acknowledge this as I go into him, I sat down very close to him because the the, um, the trooper was really large, a great guy, um, and was really in his face, and it, it meant nothing to the kid. And the, the trooper said, I'm, I'm, you want to cool off and, and uh, get out of there for a while. So I sat next to the kid. And I didn't say anything for a while. And I just said, tell me what happened in a very soft voice. And he did. He ended up, ended up confessing. So I always try to keep that in check, that, that initial prejudice that I may have for whatever reason. And when we do it with a statement, it's much easier. And I work with a, a team of um, some of the best professionals in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, South Africa, um, all over. And we practice push pushback. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll flag the sensitivity indicators, and then we'll do everything we can to explain them away, to dismiss them. Everything we can. And if what's left, and we can't do it, our presupposition of truth has been destroyed. The person is lying to us. So but we always have to be aware of the prejudice that we bring in. You know, uh, Fauci, I've done for a while. And um, so, you know, it's a, a little bit... Uh, there's quite a bit more there. To be aware of that, um, tricky. It's tricky because I don't want to prove what I think is right. I want to. I want it to fall on me and speak to me. It guide me. Sometimes the people I despise didn't do it. Sometimes the people I think highest of they did it. Yeah. Um, 
question here, and this should be for everyone anyway, but Peter, what do you think of polygraphs? I think they're marvelous. I think that uh, if you use, you, the examiner, the subject's own language, they're just about foolproof. Once we move into an area where we're using our language, then I think we're going to have trouble because there's not that same sensory response or hormonal response that the subject may have. If I, I think in the example, uh, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Ms. Lewinsky. If he was asked on a polygraph, did you have sexual relations with that woman, Ms. Lewinsky? And he said, no, he may have passed because he had a subjective understanding of sexual relations that's different than the rest of us. If he was asked, tell us what sexual relations are beforehand, screening. And he was able to explain that. And if he was asked, did you have sexual contact? He wouldn't have passed. So an examiner that uses the language of the subject only, which is what we try to mimic in the interviewing anyway, uh, I think it's terrific. Greg and Scott. Yeah, so what I would say is, excuse me, <coughs> what I would say is exactly what you finished with, Peter. You have to be a good interrogator for it to work. It's not a magic tool. And what I think you're doing, it, yeah, we're, you're measuring the same thing we're trying to do with body language. We're trying to look for pale skin. We're trying to look for respiration increase, heart rate. If you use it that way and you're an interrogator and using it that way, I, I call it a great prop for a good interrogator or a good prop for a great interrogator is what I typically say. And I think there are a lot of people who think it's a magic box and it'll tell you if someone's lying. And I, I just don't think that's the case. I think the best interrogator using it will get results. A bad interrogator using it, you get nothing. It's my opinion. Yeah. Well, well I, I think when people ask me, and I, Brian, the guy that asked the questions in our membership, hey, Brian, and uh, uh, I, I always tell them that get the, the person who's been doing it the longest, get the oldest person they can say, I'll take the lie detector test, but you bring me the person who's been doing this the longest if you didn't do it, because that person's going to be able to, that, that will be your best shot at them understanding whether you did it or not because of their experience with the equipment and their experience with, with people um, from the interrogation side of it. They know how to ask questions to, to make these things in your fire off. The older the person is or the one who's been in that business the longest, that's the person you want. I think that's the key to that. So I agree with, I agree with both of you guys on that. All right. And I got a super chat here. So I <clears throat> got the grip going, got it in. <laughs> is there a particular interrogation slash interview that is specifically memorable due to due to its shocking or enlightening nature or something that just shifted your personal paradigm, Scott? Well, it didn't shift my personal paradigm necessarily, but I, when I saw it, I was like, this, this is, it's tough to find an interrogation and go, ah, oh, it's perfect. But when Jim Smith talked to Russell Williams, for me, that was, it was, it was breathtaking. It was so good. It was because he just, his total approach to that was just so, was, was just perfect. I mean, he came on like he was an accountant or something and it just went so smoothly. And the, and, and the, the Russell Williams, I don't, I don't think he had any earthly idea what was happening, how, how he was getting into him and, and doing that. And having, we've, we've talked to Jim a couple of times, Greg and I have, and it was, and he's a brilliant guy. He really is. Great and when you talk to him, then you understand what, yeah, how he did it. But when you're watching it, you're like, how's he doing this? You see him doing it and he's doing everything the right way. And you can see him start to, to he just lays things out there, lays things out there. And you can tell these little things are still going in his head as he's like, you know, later on, once he's laid them out, he starts thinking about it. It was, it was brilliant. That for me, I don't, you know, if, if the Martians came down and said, we need to see the, we need to see what an interrogation is. What's the best one? I'd say that it's on YouTube, man. Go here and check this guy out. It's go up look at Russell Williams interrogation by Jim Smith. That it's, it, it's perfect. It's, and I, and when I saw that, I said, wow, <laughs> you know, it can be done. It can be, cause you can do things. And, and at the end of it, it always seems like it gets a little messy. A lot of times, you know, somebody's mad or somebody's, you know, they leave angry or, you'll leave feeling weird. But in that case, I think, I think everybody from the beginning to the end, it went really well and everybody left the way they should have left. So I, the that's the one drop. that's my favorite one. Yeah. Do I, I had that mic drop moment at the end too. When he said, oh, do you yeah. have a map? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, that, that was just yeah. like, it, it was almost perfectly Hollywood staged. It was so well done. Yeah. It's like, so what are we going to do and all that? And then finally he just 
you know, that giant pregnant pause and you got a map. It's like, yeah. oh my God. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Um, Peter. That's a great question. Um, the most memorable one for me was a uh, young handicapped woman um, who alleged that she had been raped. And um, because of her, her status as handicapped, there were advocates involved. Um, the governor's office was involved many years ago. Um, her therapist, she had a team around her supporting her. And um, when I interviewed her, I had to, to turn away. I had to turn away from her because um, in her physical state, it was just, uh, it aroused pity in me that was interfering with my thinking. Mm. And I, I felt quite a bit of pressure with this because there's a, a kid that if, if he did it, he's, he's going to go to jail, you know, a 19, 20 year old kid. And um, perhaps it was me being raised with seven sisters, but I could feel myself getting teary with the, this, this terrible account of, of this poor victim. And I thought to myself, I need to look away. I need just to listen to her. And she finally had said that um, after he did this to me, we drove back to my apartment. I called 911 and the whole thing started. And I, I heard her say the word we, and that was it. So I had, had to meet with my superior and I said, she's lying. And she was like, wait a minute, Peter, um, and reminded me how big the case had gotten and uh, where it had gone. I said, she's lying. She joined herself with the rapist moments after being raped uh, in that setting. It's not going to work with that pronoun we. So um, she said, are you willing to stake your whole career on a pronoun? I said, yes. Yes, I am. And she said, what do you advise? I said, I think um, that... I'd like to interview her in the presence of a therapist because this is going to be traumatic. And so when I said, you weren't truthful to me, she said, how do you know? And so I told her about the pronoun usage of we and how that doesn't work. And she said, yeah, well, he broke up with me. There was no suicidal ideation. There was no despondency. There was no crisis. She didn't care. And it was a real wake up call to me to not only to stay alert like that, um, but to try not to let my emotions get involved. And I was, I was young in this, but I learned a lot from that. She knows how dangerous she is, though, too, because she knows how to play it so well to everything else. It's like, oof, I wouldn't want yeah. to be alone with her. Because, I mean, she'd probably uh, kill somebody and walk away. Um, Greg? Yeah, so I would say mine's not even really an interrogation. I was in the first Gulf War in, in Kuwait, and we were the police department. We were just about intelligence, police department, you name it. And I was working with an SF team and we had the Kuwaiti army with us and we were collecting weapons. We were going and doing all that kind of thing. And a guy came in, probably my age now, and he accused this local doctor of raping his daughter. And his daughter had worked with this local doctor. And, you know, you immediately think, oh, yeah, 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 because during that war, there was a lot of crazy things that happened. You know, you've got, anytime you have a war like that, you've got civil war going on at the same time, because there's a lot of people from different countries and different ethnicities living there. And there's a lot of, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stuff going on between people. And my immediate nature, because she's crying, he's crying, all this kind of stuff was to go in and do what I do. And it really turned out, and, and Peter, you hit it earlier when you talked about talking to the young soldier, every interrogation is really a trust exercise. The screaming and yelling and all that stuff never, never works. Beating the crap out of people never works. People who do that and tell you it works, they're projecting that works and they're getting the answer they want most of the time. Anyway, I sat with these guys and in the beginning I thought, yeah, 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 it happened. But as I poked and as I prodded and as I asked more questions, I realized this guy was trying to get a vendetta against this doctor for firing his daughter because she refused to work on Iraqis. Weird, weird thing because we're there to rescue these people who've been overrun by a neighboring country. And so they're the bad guys automatically. And there was a lot of bad guy things that happened there. And I, I could give you graphic, lots of bad guy things. This was not one of them. And this was not a sympathizer. This was a guy who just said, they're human beings, I'm gonna treat them. And if you weren't paying attention, 
and it was body language and all those pieces together, you know, and this is doing through my limited Arabic. I mean, I'm not, I've never been truly fluent, but functionally fluent, my limited Arabic and bringing in another guy and asking enough questions. I started seeing cracks in the story and you'd see them cutting eyes and going back and forth at each other. And to, to realize somebody's willing to go to that length, that length to destroy somebody over whatever it was a career blight or whatever they wanted to feel like is eye opening for you. And these are civilians. These are not military folks. This is not interrogating a prisoner of war. This was just sitting in a room and there was the, the team chief, me, another guy who spoke Arabic and these two people. And what do you do when that's over? We, we didn't arrest them. Clearly the Kuwaiti army was not going to arrest these people for making an accusation. So you wonder what could happen after that. And that's eye opening. And probably Eric has a lot to do with my whole Maslow obsession because it <laughs> ties right back to Maslow. You know, I, I think it's funny I, I, and fine. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with everybody having their favorite um, thing because everybody's got to start somewhere. And if you always start from that one place and you just go find your path from there, there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's just, okay, well, this is generally the place from which I start and then you go forward it makes sense um by the way i just noticed scott your books um, represented very well three out of four ain't bad oh thank you <laughs> right there got it over peter i've got to get your copy of my book got up here. Got to get i'm reading copy. peter's i'm actually reading peter's book right now and there and it's your fault that i'm so dang sleepy right now peter i blame <laughs> you because if i'm looking like this that's why because i've got a kindle and everything goes on that and it's really good it's uh, some of the things you talk to do i People usually say the opposite about the sleep with the book. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I've was, got yours on order. I'm looking forward to reading it too. So. A lot of the things that we talked about today, I, I didn't want to go, that's in your book. That's in your book. But a lot of that was in your book. It was in your book. I, yeah, it's a, it's a great book, man. I've actually learned a lot from that because we're not we're not in the business you're in. We're in sort of the same right. business. We don't do what you do. It's it, It's, man fascinating especially that stuff when you were talking about where we talked about fauci when he was a child growing up as a liar how that develops i never thought of it that way you know you, you like from a kindergarten level moving up to to become a professional liar in other words anyway we won't get into all that but i i, I like your book man it's great just an onion just an onion you keep doing what makes you successful <laughs> there. Can, I ask, can i ask a question that be okay yeah. it's just a body language question that i'd like to hear about um, body language analysis is something that everyone does. Some do it with training, without training, well, not well. But it's also something that children do. Uh, instinctively from the beginning, they survive by and learn to negotiate life by reading faces. What impact do you think we may see with the masking of children for the past year and a half? Hmm. Mm. So what? someone asked me this question about Botox a long time ago, about you know taking away all the movement of the face. I, I think we do lose something. I think with a lower face covered, children may be more attentive to other muscles. You know, we use all this forehead and all that to drive home points. They may be more attentive to that than some of the other pieces and to eyes because children are, you probably know better than I do, but children are wonderfully plastic little creatures and whatever input they get, they work from. And I think we turn all that, in my opinion, we turn all that off as we age out of polite behavior. And if we were all just like little children, we'd probably notice a lot more things. I don't think that they're great at reading body language, but I do think they're great at observing body language. Yeah. And they see things. It, I, when I teach, I always say review. And review is nothing about making a decision. It's just collect everything you can see like a two-year-old because their little brains are on fire collecting everything they can get their hands on. And I, I think it could go either way. It, it would be interesting to see in places where People have not been masked as much. Of course, that experiment's hard to carry out, but whether their children are better at reading body language or worse, it would be interesting. I think it could yeah. help, um, especially like with the smiles, especially mm -hmm. because before you can cut, people get caught up in the smile and it. not pick yeah. up it's really a Duchenne smile. But now there is no smile. You either have it or you don't have it. And well, well, children, a lot of times when they're little bitty children, the first thing you see is those eyebrows go up because there's somebody coming over your crib and they're going, hey, what's going on? And you have, have that going on. One thing I learned early was the more you do this to a little kid, the more they'll they'll zoom in on you and they'll they'll pay attention to you. I can make a kid follow me all the way through Cracker Barrel when I first get there. There's a little baby there and you talk to him and you keep doing this. Hey, when you talk to him, I think the first 
I think that's the reason the eyebrows, for me anyway, I believe it plays a very important part. You've got the masking thing happening, but I think kids pay a, a lot of attention to the eyes and the eyebrows because that's where they see acceptance. That's where they see, um, I don't, I'm not into what you're doing off from their mom or dad, whoever's leaning over that crib, looking into them and talking to them when they're laying there, they're, they're seeing that that's the biggest move they see other than the mouth. So I think that plays a, a, a big role in it. So I think the, you know, thank goodness we'd have to cover up our eyebrows, but I think, I think it may have some effect on children, but I think they could still see what was going on if they were in trouble or not. And if they were being accepted for what they were doing or condemned for what they were doing with the eyebrows, I think they understand that from early on. And you know, I'm eyebrow and forehead obsessed. So I think it's how we yeah. link with each other, how we communicate intent from across the room. One of the things that we know is that people that recognize each other do that very quickly when they walk up on each other. And I've, I've used that in interrogation rooms before, Peter, where I've, two guys are captured near each other, don't know each other. You walk them past the room and both their brows rise. Okay, come on in. We're going to have a chat. It's really interesting to watch. Yeah, the eyebrow flash. That's okay. Hey, yeah. what's up, man? I call it the sup man, sup dude, because it's sup yeah. man, they got yeah. sup dude. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to ask the question. Mm -hmm. oh, of course, that's why we're all here. Um, I thought this was a really good question, too. Um, and I kind of believe that there may be something to it. As a human interacting with people, I have found when I start feeling confused talking with someone, I usually end up realizing that there was deception happening. Do you guys see anything in that statement? Well, I, I think it depends. I think that I, I said this to somebody earlier today. I think the best indicator that you're lying verbally is probably your phone. It predicts what you're going to text next because you do it so much. And I, I think as we progress, we're going to lose some of that. People get so narrow in their focus. I have a friend who edits every story he tells four times before he finishes it and never really finishes. He just drops off the end. I'm confused talking to him half the time, but he's not usually lying. So I think it depends on the person you're talking to. But I think you can't understand it if it's that complex. You should probably wonder why it's that complex because we all are born capable of doing the same things unless we have some kind of disability. And we probably can understand at least what they're talking about if they're telling you a linear story. It's when it does that, that gets confusing for people. I think my hmm. opinion. Anybody else on that? We have an expression saying that if you just come off an interview and you feel really chaotic, probably the person's a borderline. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Um, and on that note, uh, somebody's here asking, we're running short on time. Um, and this is, of course, a heavy question, but it's true. Um, how do you po possibly process all this evil stuff? And I mean, like you gave the example earlier, Peter, uh, how you went and saw the baby first. Um, how do you guys cope? Scott, he looks like he's shrinking. So. Oh, uh, <laughs> you, 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 you. Keep it to yourself or you talk to somebody else that is familiar with what you do for a living. Greg and I talked about this uh, actually, yeah, I think yesterday um, on our thing, on our uh, live Q&A. If it's bugging you, you go talk to somebody about it. I, I have several people that call when things like that are bugging them. So it helps you get, you, you're talking to somebody that understands where you're coming from. They're not going, you do, what happened? Oh my God, you got to be, none of that. It's like, oh, I get it. I've seen, okay, I know what you're talking about. I got, it. so you need to get, you need to, if you feel like you need to talk to somebody, because otherwise you're putting it in a box and putting down here, <laughs> one day it's going to come out, man. That box is going to bust open and here it comes and you don't want that to happen. So you got to talk to somebody about it. Greg's been my sound, sounding board a few times. So that, that's, that's my suggestion. If, if you, especially if something's really bothering you, it's keeping you up and you can't sleep, those kind of things. Or if you first come out of it and you know, it's going to be one of those. Yeah. Then call somebody up and go, dude, I got to tell you about this. And it's not like I've got to tell you my feelings about it. none of that. They understand why you're calling. So that's my approach anyway. Right. Yeah. I, I would say this. Um, everybody has to, design some kind of system for dealing with whatever it is. I mean, the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, I wouldn't tell a person that has not been in that world. I mean, it's just not possible for them to, to work their head through. I would say also, look at all of us. Look at these little residual lines we all have. <laughs> We've all been doing this. All of us have some pretty good residuals by our age because we etch our face with 
you know, things that we've done with our face. Number one. The other one is I would say, if you look at most of the bureau folks I've ever met, they're very contained. That's because they've seen a lot of stuff and it's all locked up in there and they just, they're not going to come out and share it with you. Cops the same way. I mean, some cops are, you know, a little bit above board. It's, it's a method that people learn and, and you're, you're dead on Scott. I think you don't talk about that with people who don't have the utility or, or the, the framework in their head to deal with it. If you don't have a box in your head for putting that information, it's horrible. It's horrible. I, a great example. I was driving down the road one day with a friend out in Arizona and I happened on an accident. She's a doctor. And I said, do you want to get out and check this or let me do it? And she said, well, I deal with people who die every day. And I said, this is not going to be like that. This is very different from watching somebody die in a hospital. And she was glad I went and checked everything. And she even said, I don't have that in my head in a way that somebody who's been to war or that kind of thing does. And I think that's a key is having framework in your head for where things live and understanding that people are capable of horrible things is what you do after a while. And Peter, I'm sure you've got a different kind of take on that. But. No, it's very similar actually. Um, I have a, a brilliant analyst that works with us that she will say at the end of a session, six hours inside a, a, a really bad person's head through the statement. And she'll say, I need to take a shower. And she, in other words, to wash that off of her. And that's the same thing. It, it comes to talking to someone that is in the field, that someone that understands that. Um, that's that's critical. Um, I also play sports, and that helps. Um, music, a lot of times, we don't watch much TV, but the music, I think, is, is really very relaxing. But without that processing with someone that, that's trusted, it's rough. All right. Well, to wrap things up, I've got a um, a quote from somebody that I know at least uh, Scott and Greg know, James Pyle. And he stated this ahead of time when I was announcing the show or commented on. But I think it's I think you guys might agree, but you might not. I don't know. But his statement is because we're bringing two disciplines together, that congruency is the currency of body language meets statement analysis. Boom. Yeah. 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 And you know what would be a good show is Jim and Peter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that would be good. Jim's a yeah. questioning guru and he is he's methodical yeah. with questioning. Yeah. I when we talked about polygraph earlier, what I usually say to people is all we're doing, all any good interrogator all, and all of us have interrogated. What we're doing is we're trying to read verbal cues, nonverbal cues, cadence of speech, respiration, body response. And they all should be doing this. They shouldn't be going like that. I shouldn't be really yeah. calm with my words and <laughs> with my body language. It, it's a good indicator that things are, that'd, don't match. And that that'd be good. such a great show, Eric. You got to do that. That's what I'd love to see. I would. I'd, I mean, that's yeah, what I would, so would no I. matter when it was, I'd, I'd make sure I watched that as it went down. You got to do that. Well, I'm definitely trying to put it together. I'd like to put everybody here together in, in another way. I hope you're all up for that. Yeah, but do those two first. Barely are scratching. Huh? Yeah, but 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 do do Jim and Peter first. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, it would be great. All right. Yeah, it really would be. All right, sounds wonderful. So you know what that means. Everybody needs to subscribe, so that way there's a nice. Well, let us do that for you, Eric. Each of us will do it. Each of us will do it, guys. This is one of my favorite shows to hit, and not just to be here, but to watch because. Look, we're talking to Peter Hyatt. We're pretty jazzed. We're talking to Peter Hyatt. Yeah, that's pretty cool stuff. And Eric does this all the time. He brings like people from multiple disciplines together, but people who are world name people like Peter here for you. So subscribe. Yeah, no kidding. And if he's going to bring, and he brings the uh, sometimes the combinations you won't see anywhere else. I'm excited about getting Peter and, and Jim together. I think I Me think too. that'd be wonderful because it's 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 two it's two skill sets that are in the same world actually our skill set is different than, than peter's skill set his it, we're nowhere near what he does we don't we have nothing to we do but we don't have anything to do with that but when you bring those two together they're both you know gargantuan in those worlds and then man it would just be so good that so anyway so that's what eric does all the subscribe. time he brings people together subscribe. like that. yeah so you gotta subscribe you got to one step further is um, Steve Johnson uh, teaches handwriting analysis. Um, mm. He's also great at deception detection and um, a lot of years of experience as a detective in Arizona. Uh, he won me over with his discipline. He's very, very disciplined with the um, handwriting analysis. 
I like put it all together. It would be kind of neat. Great. No, I'm totally, totally open to that. So thank you guys. Oh, very, very much. And I can't wait to see.